Hi, welcome to yet another MotorAge TST webinar. This one very special for us. We're recording live here at McDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida. McDill Air Force Base is home of the 6th Air Mobility Wing. It also plays host to U.S. Central Command and the United States Special Operations Command. But we're not here for any of that. We're here with a very special group of men and women, and those are the men and women, and make sure I get this correct, of the 6th Logistics Readiness Squadron Vehicle Management Flight. Those are the men and women here at McDill that do the same thing you and I do, keep the military's ground vehicles running so that the mission of the 6th Air Mobility Wing can be carried out. Let's start off with talking about what's new in AC. Um, you guys got a little bit of that earlier today. Let me kind of give a background for the benefit of those who are watching. Several years ago, the European Commission decided that R134A was a bad thing uh, because of its global warming potential. Uh, they even assigned it a number, and what they do is they compare it with carbon dioxide as the base. So if we say it has a, a, a 150 GWP number, what that means is that it's 150 times worse in global warming potential than carbon dioxide is. Okay, so that's the baseline. So essentially what they said was you can't use anything in new cars made after a certain date and time, which that deadline has come and passed, um, that has a global warming potential over 150, I believe the number was. Well, 134A is something like 1300 or some really high number like that. So that was out. Um, the search went on for a new gas. It was, uh, some of the ones that were considered were uh, 152A, which is the same stuff that is in those little cans of uh, compressed air that you get to blow the dust off your computer keyboard. Um, but that's a flammable gas, so it, it, they didn't like that much. You know, certainly we don't want anything catching fire. Um, another one that was really quick up was R744. Um, anybody remember what 744 is? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, yeah. And that's the baseline. So in terms of global warming potential, it can't get any better than one, right? So, so that was considered. And it is a good re uh, refrigerant. The only problem is the system pressures that were in use. I mean, I, if I remember the numbers right, you're looking at system operating pressures of 2,500 PSI. Uh, so if you're out here doing a test on a running system and you do something wrong, that could be a bad thing. Um, if that erupts inside the cabin, that might not be too good. Um, anything, of course, associated with a vehicle safety-wise can be dealt with with secondary systems and warning systems and so forth. So it wasn't totally off the table, but that was a major drawback. A lot of the companies that want to have to deal with not only the pressures, but having to design a whole new system, you know, and putting that under the assembly line. So then came along DuPont and Honeywell's product it's, uh, called HFO 1234YF, um, R number R1234YF. R1234YF has very similar characteristics to 134A. It can be used, it's almost a drop in to the system that's on this vehicle and gain it, uh, pretty much the same efficiency. Pressure temperature relationships about the same. So that made a lot of sense you know, uh, for us to go to. Everybody was on board with us. Everybody was on board with us. But then Daimler produced a model, released it here in the United States and elsewhere, equipped with 1234YF, did some testing of their own, and came to the conclusion that even though it was classified as mildly flammable, it turned out to be more flammable than they wanted to accept the risks for it. They claimed it was unsafe and refused, refused to abide by the European Commission rules and regulations that we will not use it on our vehicles. Um, they even started up a, a cooperative research project to uh, go back over all the data again. And again, they came to the same conclusions. It's not a problem when you use in cars. Yes, it's mildly flammable, but you know, that's not a problem. There's stuff under here that'll burn a lot faster you know, than this gas will, but Daimler still was holding out and holding out. Uh, still are. Um, 
They even recalled the cars that they did release in the United States and switched them back over to 134A. They thought that much about it. Uh, so what are they interested in? The CO2. They want the carbon dioxide systems is what it seems. And they're not the only German manufacturer that, that I think feels this way. So will we see carbon dioxide systems in vehicles in the United States? I, probably so. Probably so. And for the benefit for everybody who's watching, working in the independent shops, either gas, while it's in cars now, um, all the cars that you're going to be servicing in the field, out in the private sector, are under factory warranty. So the dealers are going to have to deal with this right off the bat. Um, if you're a collision repair business or a salvage yard, you're going to have to be able to deal with 1234YF because people wreck new cars all day long. Um, if you're in an area where uh, there are no dealer alternatives close to your shop, you know, then you're going to have to, they're going to have to deal with it. So that's really a call for you guys who are watching and own the shops uh, of what your particular market is. You know, do, do I tell you to go right out and buy the equipment? No. Is that the only refrigerant? Well, no. 1234YF is really expensive. It's like 10 times more expensive than 134A. So like I told you guys this morning, it's something like $1,100 for a 20-pound jug. Crazy, crazy cost. Um, Mexichem has come out with a blend refrigerant called R445A, which is currently being looked at. Much cheaper, again, similar characteristics to 134. If that comes about, you know, we could be looking not only here in your facility, but every place that works on, on cars of any kind could be dealing with as many as four different refrigerants. And, and think of that, guys. It's like you have to have a recovery recycling equipment for each single refrigerant you deal with. That could get expensive, and that's decisions, fellas, that you may have to look forward to you know, when planning your own uh, capability as a shop. So that takes care of kind of the background where we are now. GM and Chrysler uh, have both announced plans to convert their model lines to 1234YF, not all at one shot, but over time. Uh, so I guess I should address that. Why would they bother doing that? Because you got to set all that up in your assembly line. You got to make some changes to the system design. The operator, for example, is different. Um, why would you go to that cost as a manufacturer? Well, how many of you know what CAFE is? And not in motorcycles. Okay, CAFE is the corporate average fuel economy standards that the government sets. And I think 2021, they have to be up to something like 50 plus miles per gallon. In other words, it, all the vehicles that GM sells, that's the average they have to meet. Okay, now think of that with a big old, you know, 2,500 pickup. Uh, you know, huge V8s, guzzling gas, you know, they got to do something, right, to get that down. That's why you see a lot of companies building hybrids now. Uh, introducing light diesels, you know, are becoming more because of the fuel economy. Well, another way they can do it is they can buy credits to offset it. And they uh, can buy credits, say, uh, you guys all know who Tesla is, right? Big electric car company, right? Uh, High-end sports cars. Well, they have no emissions, do they? So they earn a lot of credits that they in turn can sell to GM or Ford or another manufacturer to offset the cafe requirements. Or I can do something in the vehicle to make it more green. And switching to 1234YF is a way to do that. And that's how GM, that's why GM and Chrysler are doing it. They can earn the cafe credits and help meet that, that standard. Okay? So that's, that brings us up to date there. Um, a couple observations for, for you guys and for those who are watching. First, 134A isn't going anywhere. That's good for however long there are 134A cars on the market. And considering that the average car in the US fleet is nearing almost 12 years of age, people are hanging on to their cars a lot longer. So that's something that we'll still have for a long, long time. Um, we are expecting to see the EPA recommend that 134A be discontinued for use in new model platforms. Uh, that, if it hasn't been issued by the time this video gets out online, it's probably in the very near future. Uh, again, will that affect us? Will we be looking at the retrofits that we did many, many years ago? No, you won't see any of that. Um, okay. I know you guys don't make a lot of money, right? They don't pay you enough. I'll be the first one to admit it. So when your car AC system breaks down, what do you try to do? You try to fix it yourself? Especially since you're already working on this stuff anyway, right? It's not like it's totally foreign to you. 
So you go down to the local Napa or Walmart and you're shopping down the aisle and you're looking for that, you know, something to put back in the car. And what do you see? Those little baby cans of refrigerant, right? And they're what, 10, 12 bucks for a can. Most everyone I've seen, at least around this area, has sealant in them. You know, they tell you with sealant, with dye, everything you need in one can. Even has a little pressure, a little hose with a little gauge in it that tells you, yes, green, you're done. All of that good stuff. Guy goes out, needs to fix his car, he takes it to the shop. If you bring it to me, okay, first, I'm charging you a flat rate. And generally, shops may be getting anywhere up to an hour and a half just to recover and recharge the system. And if you've got a leak somewhere, then I have to do that, don't I? And I'm going to have to charge you for the refrigerant I put in. And then I'm going to have to charge you in the time to check it out, maybe another hour. So that can be expensive. You can two, three hundred bucks just to find out that your evaporator is leaking or something. So the DI's do it yourself, or he's thinking, let's see, Walmart, 12 bucks, you know, local shop, 300. Well, if I go ahead and take the 12 buck fix and it works, well, I save myself 280 some dollars, right? And if it doesn't work, then what I'm out, 12 bucks? Okay, so he might shoot one can, maybe shoots two cans, who knows? It doesn't work, then he ends up in the shop to get it worked on. You don't know what's going on with the system. So that's one of the very first things we wanna do is we wanna find out what's in the system, make sure there's no contaminants, no sealant. Counterfeits we have to talk a little bit about. Um, recently, and we've reported on it in the pages of Motor Age, a few years ago in the shipping industry, well, even before that, 2006 in Europe, there were several unexplained, what was called catastrophic failures in AC systems. I mean, stuff blowing up. And nobody knew why it was causing the failures. Then the shipping industry uh, started having similar issues. Uh, at least three deaths that I'm aware of were reported uh, related to this. Finally found out the reason. You know, counterfeiters have been around forever. Just because that can looks like the 134 can that you bought yesterday, doesn't mean that what's in there is what you paid for. Uh, in this case, these containers contain a mixture. Um, one element in that mixture was a chemical called R40. Uh, R40 has a big, long scientific name for it. Don't really need to go into that. But what you do need to know is that when it mixed with the aluminum components in the AC unit, it formed a very dangerous substance that would combust when it was exposed to air. When is it going to be exposed to air? Sorry. Right. When you're charging, when you connect your service equipment, if a leak develops, I mean, if you guys, here we are at McDill Air Force Base, you know, if one of these choppers takes off, one of these uh, tankers takes off, something happens in that system, gets a leak, it's got this stuff in it, that's bad, you know. Uh, so the U.S. Army, sorry, uh, Tank Automotive Research Development and Engineering Center, you know, you guys in the acronyms, I, don't, I can't keep track of any of that stuff. They actually set out, first, the very first thing they set out was they shut off all uh, supplies uh, being bought locally, because that's what was happening. These counterfeit products were being purchased locally in theater overseas and then being used on, on ground vehicles. Uh, to try to make this a, a long story short, uh, if you want to read the whole story, check out the May issue. Uh, there's an article about the whole process there for you. But long story short, the Army started testing all their ground vehicles. They found 25% were contaminated. The R40 was a small part, but it was a whole lot of other things that were in there. In fact, from their report, there were 18 different contaminants in their AC systems. Everything from the R40 to hydrocarbon blends, the butane and propane, the stuff that likes to burn, uh, R22, R30, whole mixture of stuff in there. So if it's happening to them, it can happen to the rest of us. Now, there are safeguards in place in the United States, so it's not as bad here but it's still a possibility. And again, go back to your do-it-yourself or You don't know what he's sticking in that car. Do you want that in your service equipment? Do you want this four or $5,000 piece of equipment to be down for two weeks, taking money out of your pocket when you're at the peak of AC season? Of course you don't. So let's start with the sealant. Let me go grab that. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna check for the presence of sealant. Now there's some prep that you normally would do to prepare the vehicle to check this. We're gonna run the AC for a little while get everything good and circulated. Now, the way sealants work is either come in contact with moisture or air, they solidify. So think about this for a minute. If you draw that into your equipment, your recovery machine, and you have a small leak in one of the lines there that you don't know about, it'll clog up your machine. You don't know why the machine's not working anymore, so now it's sitting in the corner, not usable. 
you end up calling somebody out to fix it, you're down who knows how long and out so much money, right? So um, after the machine is prepped, we need to prep our, our tool. And it's really not that, that complicated a device here. Each one has a fixed orifice, okay? And it's just a graduated hole in here. And there's the air. And then we're gonna prime it with a little bit of water to simulate the moisture. And we're just gonna squirt a little bit on either end, shake it up, shake out the excess. Okay, then we have a coupler that fits onto the high side port of the system. We'll remove the cap. And look at that little O-ring stick in there. We'll take that too. Okay, now all of these young men were at my little session this morning getting their 609 certification. Let's say if they remember, what's so important about the cap? It's a primary seal, right? So if it's missing, put one on. So we'll set that off to the side for a minute. Next we have a vial, and there's a ball in here, very small ball, if you can see that. And it's graduated, okay? And it's a little flow meter, that's all it is. So we have our orifice in place in our fitting. We're gonna play this over, give us something to push on. We're gonna put our hose in place. And we even have a little way that we can hold this up to time it, but I'm gonna go ahead and hold that by hand. So the first thing we have to do is, is the orifice that's in here, is that flowing properly? So we're looking for a, at least a 1.5 reading on this gauge initially after we connect it. So once it's installed, we check that. All right, right now, you're not gonna be able to see this on the screen. I'm reading about three. So I'm gonna put the little band up there close to remind me. And now I'm gonna let it sit for about two minutes, two to three minutes. Now, if there's any sealant in here, what's it gonna do when it gets to that orifice? It's gonna to try to solidify, isn't it? So what we're looking for is does this flow rate drop? And if it drops more than 30% of what the initial reading is, there's sealant in it. Okay, now even here, if you should happen to get one like the F-150 sitting behind you that's being serviced off base, and you do this test on it, and you see there's sealant in it, don't pull it into there. You know, it's not a bad idea, and you guys out in the private sector, that if you do find contaminated refrigerant, use an old machine to collect it in. Make that your junk drawer, if you will. And when that junk can is full, send that off to a, 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 an official reclamation site. Make sure you follow the paperwork. You have to keep record of that for three years when you send it off site. All right. So, so far, we're not getting any change, right? So, 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 so right now, we're good. We'll assume the three minutes has passed. We don't have any sealing issues with that. Use a sealant detector like this one from Neutronics. It detects for the presence of type 2 sealant by measuring the amount of flow through a sensing plug. If sealant is present, that flow will decrease more than 30% over a few minutes of time. Here's how it's used. Assemble the test rig per the instructions supplied with the kit. Then prep the car for the test by setting the air conditioning for max cooling. Use the lowest temperature setting, maximum blower speed, and close the recirculation door. Allow the car to run for two to three minutes to make sure the refrigerant and anything that's in it has had a chance to circulate. Then turn it all off and let the car sit for another three minutes or so. Next, attach the test rig to the high side service port and monitor the flow rate for 60 seconds, noting the maximum reading. If it won't read over 1.5, you'll need to start the air conditioning up again to see if the flow rate will meet this minimum needed for the test. A low flow rate running can mean there isn't enough gas left in the pipes or there are restrictions in the service port or sensing plug. Monitor the flow rate for three minutes and note the lowest reading. If the flow rate has changed by more than 30%, there is sealant in the system. Now am I ready to service this system? Well, what do, I have to, do you think I have to do next? Test the, Test the refrigerant. Is there really 134A in here? And again, you know, you've heard us talking about the really bad stuff with the counterfeits and the contaminants, and that's all well and true. But you know what, it's like my mommy and daddy always told me, if you see something online, a great deal on refrigerant, or some guy pulls up in his shop to tell you what a great deal on refrigerant you got, it's really cheap, well, 
if it's too good to be true, probably it's probably not true, right? Yeah, so it's probably, keep an eye out for that. You can have a 30 pound jug of water, it's gonna weigh the same thing as a 30 pound jug of refrigerant. You know, you could, and this has happened where there has been sand in the tank or some other substance in the tank to make the weight up and you only get half of what you really paid for. So you have to you know, look out for what you're doing, what you're getting. All right, so we'll set that off. Let me go grab the identifier. Now, this is gonna be interesting. This is the newest uh, Neutronics identifier. This is actually a similar model to the one that the Tardic engineers are sending out as SOP for checking the ground vehicles on the Army side. And I think it's supposed to get sent out to all the branches eventually. And this is part of the official test kit procedures for that. Uh, it's very simple to use. We're just going to go ahead and start it up. We'll let that warm up. And this will do the new 1234YF. It'll do 134A. Um, some of them have been updated to identify different refrigerant blends, but the simple truth is as soon as the counterfeiters are caught and we know what they put in the tank, they come up with other stuff to put in the tank. So there's really no one identifier that's gonna be able to tell you exactly what's in the can. What you're looking for is, is this pure 100% 134A? If it's anything less than 100% pure, don't suck it into your machine. You need that, you treat it as contaminated and get rid of it. Uh, for you guys, if you have something that you suspect in the least might be contaminated with something that it shouldn't be, uh, then you need to get with your supervisors and say, hey, because the only real way to tell for sure if it has something like R40 in it is with a gas chromatograph. Okay, there's, there's really no other way to do that for sure. Okay. Warmed up, hit the button. Okay. Select refrigerant. Well, we're looking for a 134 system, so we'll click that one. Say, so connect our hose to the device. and then it asks us to calibrate. And this is gonna be interesting. I'm really curious of what's in here. All right, connect hose. All right, so we got the hose connected, open the valve, press okay. And now it's gonna test the sample. All right, well on that one, we got a pure 100% test. Right, so we're good. Whatever's in here is okay. And if we want to make sure we keep a record of it, we can actually print out that test report. And again, out in the field, this is not a bad idea to be able to print this out. Uh, even if you have a situation here, you know, uh, we can go back and say, nah, this is unknown, is 20%. That's not good. We need to figure out what that is. Now, this will pick up R12, R22. It will identify the uh, hydrocarbon blends. I can pass around and take a look at what the test report looks like. Those it'll pick up, but like I said, I mean, just recently they started R using R30. The counterfeiters aren't stupid. They make a lot of money, you know, doing that. So as soon as we figure out one thing they're putting in, they come up with something else to put in, okay? So now that we've got that done, now we know the system is okay for us to hook up. Now we're going to talk about just some basic service practices. You guys have the newer machine, which is pretty cool. Um, we'll wheel this out so the folks out there can see it. Move that out of the way. Um, if you don't have one of these in your shop, you probably want to consider investing in one. I will give you a heads up. Um, because of the 1234YF machines that are also available on the market, you will soon see offered um, machines that are combined in one cabinet. So you have the ability to service one or the other. So if you are looking for a new machine, you may want to wait and check those out. Again, depending on your market area, what you see is going to be the need um, for meeting the new refrigerant cars. Uh, if you're in a high area like here in Tampa, uh, probably leave a lot of that to the dealers at this time. Uh, but if you're in an area that doesn't serve it or, or in a business that is going to have to deal with these cars from the get-go, you may want to check that out. Now, some of the advantages to this equipment 
uh, versus the older machines that you might still have in your shop is accuracy. And one thing I want to stress, probably not so much on one of these monsters. Uh, I'm not sure where the capacity is on this one. I don't see the normal hood sticker on here anywhere. It's probably official government form or something put somewhere. Let's see. I don't see anything on there. Oh yeah, here we go, hiding under my notes. Uh, front and rear, this thing holds three pounds. So that's quite a bit. Uh, most of the newer passenger cars, there are plenty out there that hold a lot less than a pound. And under the, uh, the older machines, the accuracy just wasn't there to either charge them properly or know how much you recovered or even getting it all out. So let's real quickly, we'll talk about the recovery process. Of course, if we think there's a leak, we need to recover what's in the system. You're gonna hook up the machine to it, uh, whether in automated or manual mode. Once it's gone through the first pass, it should draw the system into a vacuum. Watch the vacuum for about five minutes. If the vacuum level rises to above zero, then there's still refrigerant in the system. Um, I can't quite see back here behind the plumbing to see exactly what this is. But this would be a good candidate if we we're in a colder climate and we had to get the refrigerant out of there for some reason for the preheats that we discussed in the 609 class. You know, letting it run long enough to get this uh, heated up, uh, maybe letting that outside air be drawn in, you know, to get the evaporator warmed up to help. And why do we do that? Why does that have to be done? What keeps that refrigerant in there longer does come out on the first pull? It's in the oil. Yeah, so the oil is actually holding on to that refrigerant charge. We gotta let that out gas in order to get it out. So if we let it sit for five minutes, as long as that pressure is building above zero, we wanna continue the process until it stays in vacuum. Now, what if it just comes to zero? Leak. Okay, if it just comes to zero, yeah, then we got a leak. You know, if it's not, can't hold a vacuum, then it's leaking somewhere. Um, so then we're gonna go ahead and, and we can recharge it with a proper amount. Uh, this looks like it already has dye in it. Come here from what, a little bit this around the low side fitting, so I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, for you guys, you know, putting dye in it, we'll discuss in a little bit of detail here in a moment. Okay, so we've got it charged back up. Now we're gonna start looking for the leaks. And uh, I share with you guys this morning the new standards for leak detectors. That's what this one is. We'll get that started up. And this actually uses a, a heated tip and a little air pole in there. It actually draws air into it in order to sample it. It's very sensitive. Um, most of these have three sensitivity settings, high being more sensitive than low. Uh, it defaults to normal. Okay, now you can hear the pump running. It's all ready to go. And there's a numeric display on it. And that gives me an indication of how big of a leak it is. Um, the higher the number, the more the leak is. And what that allows you to do is, is pinpoint where you are. Now, what are some of the tips for using this thing? Well, the higher standard allows you to be a little further away. So I can be up to 3 8 of an inch away from any line or fitting and I can move along the line faster than I could with the older tool and still pick it up. Now, this is not always totally, uh, let's see what we can pick up here. Get down. Oh, you summer little son of a gun. We'll just try it out here. One of the things that they wanted to do with new standard is to prevent false triggering. Um, oil, grease, brake fluid. There's like, I forget the number of chemicals that are, that are on the official standard list that it has to not trigger on. Let's try coolant. Okay, not picking that up. Okay. Is that washer fluid over there? Try that out. That's an exception. It will trigger on washer fluid. What's a little tip for you though, is that's a way you can check your, your, how your, meter, uh, your sniffer is working. Just go to your customer's car, hit that washer reservoir. You know, if it goes off, you know, it's working right. Um, some other tips, you know, the air's gotta be fairly still. You know, if you've got a lot of breeze blowing through the shop, or you got a fan blowing on you, then you're not gonna get a good reading around uh, the connections. 
You want to make sure that you hit all the way around. Refrigerant's heavier than air, so if I'm looking for a leak at a fitting, I want to make sure that I can bend it around and get up underneath there to check it. What about these ports? Is that Schrader valve leaking? Okay. Is that a bad thing? Not really. What was the primary seal? The cap's the primary seal. So there is, it's not unusual to be the little buildup, especially when I just had the service ports on here. If I want to check the valve for leaking, I need to blow that out, maybe with some compressed air, blow whatever residual might be in there, then maybe wait a minute with it open, and then put this back down again. Now, if it goes off, the valve itself is, you know, the Schrader's leaking more than it should, okay? Uh, common areas to look for, compressor seals. This is very good at picking up around the compressor. So again, I can get right up in here and check that, even up at the front. Internal components, what if I want to check the internal components, the evaporator? Is there a drain that you can access? Okay, so I can sniff at the drain. Uh, a lot of domestic vehicles, the, the heater resistor block is built into that same box. So I can remove the resistor block and stick this in here. Um, I think this one actually has a UV light. Yeah, it does. So that if I have a die in it, I could actually have a UV light shining on it and help me see the leak. Uh, and again, I can adjust the settings. But I, I would start with the normal. And then if you think you're getting somewhere, you, know, you can switch the settings to, to pinpoint exactly what it is. Here are a few guidelines to remember when using this tool. First, make sure the batteries are good and any filters are clean. Avoid getting oil or grease in the tip while testing. Keep it off of the surface as you move it around. Keep in mind that other chemicals may cause an alarm. Those greasy spots we found earlier, clean them off with a rag, not solvent, to avoid false results. And keep the air around the system still. A good breeze may feel good when it's hot outside, but it's going to make finding that leak harder to do. Last, refrigerant sinks so check around the bottom of hoses and joints when looking for a leak. If you do find one, back off and clear the tester, then check again. The new testers clear quickly and offer three sensitivity ranges to help you pinpoint the exact location of a leak. If you suspect the evaporator is leaking, place the probe in the evaporator drain tube, being careful to keep any water from entering the tester. Depending on the design, you may be able to get close to the evaporator core by removing the blower motor or the blower motor resistor from the HVAC casing or by entering the case through the cabin air filter housing if the car is equipped with that feature. Uh, again, a word of caution for you guys who are watching. There are uh, sniffers on the tool trucks that advertise, yes, they can detect the same level, and then this will detect down to uh, less than a quarter of an uh, ounce per year rate, uh, which is part of that new standard. And then it has the three you know, sensitivity levels and, and all the rest. But if you look closely, though, it is not certified to the SAE standard. Okay, so it is not the same as the one I'm showing you here now. So make sure that if you are in the market for a new sniffer, that it is indeed uh, meeting the latest standards and it uh, does meet that requirements. Otherwise, you're just getting one that's going to go off every time you pass by a breeze or the guy working next to you has. Mexican food for lunch, and you know, it'll go off. So we don't want to have that either, okay? All right, moving right along. What other kind of ways can we find a leak? I know you guys have a very popular method that you like to use, right? Dye. Dye. Leak detection dye. Yeah, that's a real popular out in the private sectors too. Uh, all you guys I know are using UV dye. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Once in a while, you're going to be dealing with a leak that you just can't seem to nail down with the sniffer. I had a Saturn minivan once with dual AC that had a leak in the low side line leading to the rear evaporator. The line was wrapped with a plastic sheath and moisture collected between the sheath and the aluminum line. The leak was plenty big enough to be found with the sniffer, but the plastic sheathing kept it from working. The alternative? Add a UV dye to the refrigerant. There are several tools on the market like this one from Tracerline. UV dye will circulate with the refrigerant and it will help locate a leak by its ability to fluoresce when the UV light is shined on it. But like anything else, there's a right way and a wrong way to use dye. Here are some tips on using dye in the AC system. First, many manufacturers install dye from the factory, 
usually in the form of a wafer placed in the accumulator or receiver dryer. A few even specify that this is the only way they want dye added to their systems. Why? To avoid overdosing the system or installing an oil not specified for that car. It's not the dye, it's the carrier agent used to get the dye in the system. Excessive use of dye and the solvent agent used to get it in the system can affect system and compressor lubrication. Dye added may take up to 24 hours to show up depending on the leak size. With wafers it can take as long as two weeks and dye won't circulate properly in a system that is low on refrigerant. Be sure to explain all of these limitations to your customer up front to avoid problems later. Use a good UV light and the yellow sunglasses provided in the toolkit to find that leak. Inspect carefully with an additional focus on the area around the compressor clutch and the evaporator drain. Don't forget to look for potential damage to the condenser caused by flying debris or small rocks kicked up by the car in front. It is possible to use too much dye. Again, uh, like the F-150 that's behind us, that new truck probably already has dye in it from the factory, and most new cars now do. Uh, a lot of times if you buy the replacement desiccant, the receiver, dryer, accumulator, uh, I know that for a long time they used to put wafers in there so that when the system was run for a while, those wafers would dissolve, that was the dye. And it was already in the factory part when you bought it, so you didn't need to add dye. Um, the guy before you may have put dye in it. The guy who put his own AC can may have already put dye in it. Um, so you can check real quick, just a little tap on one of the fittings, look inside the Schrader ports. You know, uh, that's a good common giveaway. The dye will, if they haven't cleaned it out, you know, the dye will be there. You can see it there. Um, it's also a good visual indication for sealant. If you see some green crusty stuff, you know, lurking in there is not a good thing. Um, make sure that you dose it according to the people who make the dye to their levels. You don't need a whole lot, uh, but it may take a while to circulate. You know, you're looking at a three, three plus pound system here, front and rear. So if I put dye in this today, um, it would probably have to be driven for a few days at a minimum to get that dye to circulate everywhere through the system and allow me to find the leak. In other words, it's not something you can put in and be done with and, and call it a day. You know, um, Don't use the kind of dye that you get that comes already in the oil, right? That's a bad thing. Um, you're actually putting too much oil in and, and like we shared with these fellows earlier, you know, if you have a car that holds four quarts of oil, you certainly aren't going to put five or six in it, are you? No, of course not. The compressor is an engine, just like the one in, that's driving the vehicle. Uh, it's a pump, and it needs to be treated with the same consideration and respect that the, that the engine itself is. Uh, that's usually where the problems happen. All right, so we've got the system leaks identified. We learned how to do, fix that part. We know how to check for sealant. We know how to check for what kind of a, uh, equipment, uh, refrigerant we have in there. Now we're ready to charge it back up again. We hook up our machine. And we have this little bottle on here. Hey, you can see the refrigerant. Uh, now this is pretty good. This has, ooh, that has something in it. Um, don't use that to inject oil back into the vehicle. First of all, you don't know what kind of oil that's in there. And most of these use one of three different weights of oil. Um, there was a whole issue, and again, you can find out more at motorage.com. Uh, you guys will probably be seeing them as they come in with the GSA fleet, the hybrids. Um, we did an article, in fact, in our May issue on some of the hybrids that are being developed right now for taking the place of the Humvee. A lot of neat stuff going on there in terms of hybrid technology. But because you're using electric compressors, that oil there can result in a high voltage leak, you know, in the system. Uh, in the civilian world, are you going to kill somebody? Probably not, but what will happen is the computer will see that high voltage leak and it shuts the high voltage system down. And how are you going to fix that? Take a guess. Everything that's in the AC system, everything has to be replaced. Everything. So that's another reason. There are separate standards for recharging uh, equipment for uh, high voltage use. Um, most of the time it's a way to flush the system between vehicles so you don't have any cross contamination with the oil. But even if we never use it for hybrid, even if we just use conventional, I don't know if that's 46, PAG 100, PAG 150. I don't know what that oil is, number one. Number two, PAG is hygroscopic, which means what? It absorbs moisture right out of the air. So I just made a big deal of doing an evacuation to get all the moisture out. 
because I don't want all these aluminum components to corrode and I'm going to dump moisture right back in it because my PAG oil is contaminated in the bottle. So I was always going to use it out of a clean sealed container before we put the PAG back in. Use the correct rate. Now how much oil do you put in? Today's vehicles are using a lot less oil, period, just like using a lower refrigerant charge. So if I'm going to put oil back in there, I'm going to go by what I did and what the manufacturer tells me for that particular application. And for you guys who are getting ready to go you know, from your military life to civilian life, and you're going to be working on stuff like that for a living, the Fords and the Chevys and the Audis or whatever else you want to get into, even though it's a diesel engine, even though it's a gas V6, whatever the case might be, these engines today are, I mean, high performance. Um, back in when I was coming up, piston and cylinder clearances, you could measure in 15, 20 thousandths of an inch. Today, they're thousandths of an inch. Um, timing, injection, everything is, just has to be exactly right for the engine to perform. You're getting horsepower out of a four cylinder that we used to get out of an eight. You know, they're high performance products. So they have no tolerance for error and they're not all the same. You, the old general rules of thumb that we may have learned when I was younger and coming up, and you may still have heard from people that worked on their own stuff for years, you can't apply to today's stuff. You know, um, you guys are on the front lines of a lot of new technology. Certainly there's a lot in the private sector that you're gonna see very, very soon. Uh, look up the information. Do your homework first before you pick up the first wrench. Well, guys, I appreciate you hanging out with me and being part of our little video presentation. Uh, if you could say it live, we'd say we get a big hand for the guys here at McDill Air Force Base in Tampa. My lovely missus there behind the camera scenes, taking the video shots. Did you have any final questions before we wrapped it up? Well, I hope you found it worthwhile. And again, I really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with me.